hello this is a past paper of May June 2018 um, component 4.2 for A level question number one a gravitational field may be represented by lines of gravitational force a state what is meant by a line of gravitational force we know that direction of force on a mass this is line of gravitational force so it is direction of force on a mass or you can say on a test mass a small test mass or on a mass next part by reference to lines of gravitational force near to the surface of the earth explain why the gravitational field strength g close to the earth's surface is approximately constant we know that at surface lines are radial and radius of earth is very large that's why lines are nearly parallel near the surface of the earth so parallel lines means constant field strength so in every part of the physics parallel lines of field means constant field strength part b the moon may be considered to be a uniform sphere of diameter 3.4 times 10 to the power 3 kilometers and mass 7.4 times 10 to the power 22 kg. The moon has no atmosphere, so it means there is no air resistance. So you can use conservation of energy for this part because there is no waste of energy. During a collision of the moon with a meteorite, Meteorite, a, a rock is thrown vertically up from the surface of the moon with a speed of 2.8 km per second. Assuming that the moon is isolated in space, determine whether the rock will travel out into distant space or return to the moon's surface. Okay. First of all, um, I would like to tell you some introduction. After that, I solve this question. We know that gravitational potential is zero in infinity. And when you come near to the Earth, gravitational potential decreases and becomes negative. So on the surface of the Earth, gravitational potential is equal to negative g mm divided by r for a particle. That's why that's why when you come closer to the earth gravitational potential decreases and kinetic energy increases so vice versa if you go away from surface of the earth kinetic energy decreases and gravitational potential energy increases okay now we use conservation of energy for this question so loss of kinetic energy is equal to gain of gravitational potential energy because there is no uh, atmosphere near the moon that's why no air resistance and conservation of energy is true for this question so loss of kinetic energy so near the earth uh, kinetic energy is 1 over 2 mv square and in infinity or very far from the earth kinetic energy is zero gravitational potential energy in infinity is zero and on the surface of the earth is negative gmm over r or uh, for example a distance from surface of the earth then gravitational potential will be negative gmm over r so if you simplify and if you cancel out mass uh, of the particle or of rock then you can get v is equal to 2.4 kilometer per second what is this speed this is minimum speed needed to escape a rock from the moon so the rock has a speed of 2.8 which is more than 2.4 therefore it has enough energy to leave the moon and travel out into distant space so you should explain 
you should explain uh, also these three last lines so they are important to uh, explain for this question so uh, you can find 2.4 kilometer per second uh, you can explain that this is minimum speed needed to escape from the moon and after that you should explain last three or four lines question two Use one of the assumptions of the kinetic theory of gases to explain why the potential energy of the molecules of an ideal gas is zero. One assumption is that there is no intermolecular forces. That's why no potential energy. Next part. The average translational kinetic energy of the molecules of an ideal gas is given by expression 1 over 2 times m times mean a square of the speed of the molecules which is equal to 3 over 2 kt m is the mass of the molecule and k is the Boltzmann constant a state the meaning of the symbol c square so this sign in mathematics means mean so this sign means mean so you can say mean a square a speed of molecules capital letter of T it is absolute temperature or you can say temperature in Kelvin or you can say Kelvin temperature <clears throat> part C a cylinder of constant volume contains an ideal gas at pressure 2.6 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal and atmosphere and temperature 173 degrees Celsius the gas is heated thermal energy transfers the gas is 2900 joule the final temperature and pressure of the gas are T and P as illustrated in figure 2.1 okay first part calculate the number of molecules in the cylinder okay First of all, uh, temperature in this kind of questions in gas chapters must be in Kelvin. So, uh, what is the equation for Kelvin? T is equal to temperature in centigrade plus 273. This is nearly because it is 0 0.15 as well, but you can ignore uh, decimal. So, you can say uh, 173 plus 273 so this is 446 Kelvin so you can use ideal equation for gases PV is equal to nRT P is given V is given uh, V must be in meter cube uh, P must be in Pascal equal to n number of molecules times number of moles times 8.31 this is R which is constant universal gas constant times temperature in Kelvin so you can get n n is equal to 3.3 mole then you should find number of molecules so for number of molecules you should use um, you should multiply number of moles times Avogadro constant Avogadro number which is 6.02 times 10 to the power 23 so number of molecules will be 2 times 10 to the power 24 the increase in average kinetic energy of the molecule during the heating process okay you know that thermal energy given to the gas is 2900 so for one molecule you should divide by number of molecules so 2900 divided by 2 times 10 to the power 24 which you get from last part so this is 2 times 10 to the power 24 number of molecules so you can find answer so this is average increase in kinetic energy which is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the power negative 21 joules use your answer in i part 2 to determine the final temperature in kelvin of the gas in the cylinder so again you know that 
change of kinetic energy of gases is equal to of molecules is equal to 3 over 2 k times change of temperature so change of kinetic energy you uh, got from part 2 so you can substitute equal to uh, 3 over 2 times k Boltzmann constant times change of temperature so delta T will be 72 Kelvin uh, to find final temperature you should say that delta T is final temperature minus initial temperature is equal to 72 so final temperature will be 72 plus initial temperature which is 446 you will get 580 or nearly 520 Kelvin. Uh, question number three. Uh, during melting, a solid becomes liquid when little or no change in volume. Use kinetic theory to explain why during the melting process thermal energy is required although there is no change in temperature. We know that when there is no change in volume, so no work done. So during melting, bonds between atoms are broken. So potential energy of atoms is increased. And we know that it is said that little or no change in volume, that's why little or no work done. So thermal energy is required to break bonds and temperature doesn't change in this question during melting okay part b an aluminium can of mass 160 gram contains a mass of 330 gram of warm water at a temperature 38 degrees celsius a mass of 48 gram of ice at negative 18 degrees celsius is taken from a freezer and put it put in to the water. The ice melts and the final temperature of the can and its contents is 23 degrees Celsius. Data to the specific heat capacity of the aluminium, ice and water are given. So this is a specific heat capacity of uh, aluminium, ice and water. Assuming no exchange of thermal energy with the surroundings, show that the loss in thermal energy of the can and the warm water is 2.3 times 10 to the power of 4 joule. Okay. We know that can and warm water, they give energy to ice. That's why uh, they lose thermal energy. So we can use delta Q, change of thermal energy is equal to mc delta theta. So we can write it for uh, aluminium can. This is for aluminium can. mc delta theta. And this is for warm water. For delta theta, you can use uh, Initial temperature, which is 38, minus final temperature, which is 23. If you subtract, delta theta will be 15 degrees Celsius. So, final answer for loss of thermal energy for can and warm water will be 2.3 times 10 to the power 4 joule. Use the information in part 1 to calculate a value L for the specific latent heat of the fusion of ice. Okay. So, we know that in this kind of questions, uh, aluminium can and warm water, they gives energy and ice gets the same amount of energy if there is no loss of energy or waste of energy. That's why you can use answer of part I for second part. The same amount of energy with, uh, which can and warm water lose, ice gets. 
the same amount of energy. So you can use the answer of this part for second part, 2.3 times 10 to the power 4 joules. Now this time you should use ice information. So first of all, uh, temperature of ice is negative 18 degrees Celsius. So it, mu uh, it must reach to 0 degrees Celsius, ice of 0. So you need mc delta theta for ice of negative 18. Um, convert to ice of 0 degrees Celsius. After that, melting happens. So you should use latent heat of fusion. And after that, ice change to water. That's why you should use sea of water for third part. So mass of ice 48 times a specific heat capacity of ice 2.10 times 18 change of temperature to reach to zero and then ml for melting mass of ice times a specific latent heat after that, ice change to water, so you should use sea of water. Mass of ice, but sea of water. And change of temperature, final temperature will be 23. That's why change of temperature for this part will be 23. So be careful, uh, you shouldn't put 18. You should put 23 because now you have water. So if you calculate to get L, L will be subjected. So L is equal to 345 Joule per gram. Question four. A state two conditions necessary for a mass to be undergoing simple harmonic motion. Number one, you know that in simple harmonic motion, acceleration is directly proportional to displacement. So you can write this condition and the second condition, you know that formula for acceleration is equal to negative omega squared times x times displacement. So because of this sign, this sign of negative, you can say that acceleration and displacement are in opposite direction because when acceleration is positive, displacement is negative. When displacement is negative, so negative times negative, that's why acceleration become positive. Okay, this is first part. Part B. A trolley of mass, 950 gram, is held on a horizontal surface by means of two springs attached to fixed points P and Q. So these are fixed points and two springs uh, and one trolley mass of 950 gram. The springs each having a spring constant of 230 newton per meter are always extended. The trolley is displaced along the line of the springs and then released. The variation with time t of the displacement x of the trolley is shown in figure 4.2. Okay. Now, first question. A state and explain whether the oscillations of the trolley are heavily damped, critically damped, or lightly damped. As you can see in figure, amplitude decreases gradually. That's why it is light damping. You can see that am amplitude is here and after that decrease a little bit. So this is light damping. Suggest the cause of damping. So you know that cause of damping is loss of energy. So why in this question due to air resistance or friction in wheels? You can write uh, many answers for this part. but. Uh, I wrote two of them, so you need one of them. So you, if you write air resistance, it is okay. Or you can write friction in wheels. So you should write, you must write loss of energy. So due to one of them, air resistance or friction in wheels. 
The acceleration of the trolley of mass M may be assumed to be given by the expression A equal to negative 2K over M X times X. Calculate the angular frequency of the oscillations of the trolley. Okay, you know that acceleration is equal to negative omega squared times X. And omega is angular frequency. So if you compare these two formula, if you compare these two formula, you can get a result that omega squared is equal to 2k over m. So 2 times k, k is 230 for each spring, divided by m. m is 950 gram for trolley, uh, change it to kg, so 0 0.950 kg. So omega squared become 484, and if you uh, you can find omega root a square both sides, so omega will be 22 radian per second. Uh, part two, determine the time t1 shown on figure 4.2. Okay, t1 is here. T1 is here. Okay, so. From this point, from uh, first point when time is zero, to this point, to nearly this point, it is one complete cycle. And this is half a cycle. So in total, it, T1 is 1.5 uh, time period, because from here to here is one complete time period, and here from this point to uh, T1, it is half time period. So if you add them, T1 will be 1.5 time period. So first of all, find time period. Time period is 2 pi over omega, because you know that omega is equal to uh, 2 pi over T. That's why T is equal to 2 pi over omega. So you can find T and a uh, time or t1 you can write uh, t1 t1 is equal to 1.5 time period which is equal to 0 0.43 seconds question 5 in radio communication the bandwidth of an fm transmission is greater than the bandwidth of an am transmission a state what is meant by bandwidth so range of frequencies of signal is called bandwidth range of frequencies of signal one advantage and one disadvantage of the greater bandwidth uh, for advantage you can write better quality or less distortion for disadvantage you can write fewer stations in any frequency range so there are less, I mean, fewer stations. This is disadvantage of greater bandwidth. Part B, a carrier wave has a frequency of 650 kilohertz and is measured to have an amplitude of five volt. So carrier wave, five volt. The carrier wave is frequency modulated by a signal of frequency 10 kilohertz this is signal frequency 10, amplitude of 3 volt. The frequency deviation is 8 kilohertz per volt. Determine for the frequency modulated carrier wave, the measured amplitude. So the measured amplitude is 5 volt. So you can write measured amplitude is 5 volt. The maximum and minimum frequencies. First of all, you should find frequency deviation. Frequency deviation is 8 kilohertz per volt. And uh, amplitude of frequency modulated is 3 volt. That's why 3 times 8 is 24 kilohertz. So this is frequency deviation. If you add frequency deviation, to frequency of a carrier wave, 
you will get maximum. If you subtract, you will get minimum frequency. So 674 and 626 will be answered for this part. The minimum time between the maximum and a minimum transmitted frequency. So between the maximum and minimum, you know that it takes half a cycle. So half a cycle, uh, time will be half of time period. So first of all, find time period. Time period is, uh, you know that T is equal to one over frequency. So find T. Frequency is uh, given. Frequency is, frequency of signal is 10 kilohertz. It is given. So 10 times 10 to power three, uh, you convert it to Hertz. One over 10 times 10 to power three will be time period. Time period is one times 10 to the power negative four seconds. Half of that is equal to five times 10 to the power negative five seconds. Because a time between a maximum and a minimum is half of a time period. Uh, question 6. Explain what is meant by the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. So we know that capacitance is charge over potential. Uh, charge is equal to charge of one plate on one plate and potential is potential difference between plates. So you should explain everything about this formula. Capacitance is equal to charge over potential. You should explain charge and potential. Three parallel plate capacitors each have a capacitance of six microfarad. Draw circuit diagrams, one in each case, to show how the capacitors may be connected together to give a connect uh, to give a combined capacitance of nine microfarad. Okay, you know that capacitors in parallel. To find total capac capacitance, you should uh, find. Uh, sum of each uh, capacitance and for capacitor in series you should use 1 over total C is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 that's why for example uh, I draw this figure for 9 microfarad so uh, 6 and 6 if you use 1 over 3 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6 is equal to 1 over C of total 1 over C of total so C total will be 3 microfarad and uh, in parallel you should add them so 3 plus 6 will be 9 so this is 9 and for 4 First of all, two parallel, 6 and 6. So for parallel, 6 and 6 is 12. So 6 plus 6 is 12 microfarad. And then use 1 over C total is equal to 1 over 6 plus 1 over 12. So C total will be 4 mic microfarad. This is for this part. So this is 4. Next part. Two capacitors of capacitances 3 mic microfarad and 2 microfarad are connected in series with a battery of electromotive force of 8 volt. Part 1. Calculate the combined capacitance of the capacitors. Okay, as I said in last page, they are series. That's why you should use 1 over C equal to 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3. So C is 1.2 microfarad. Use your answer in part 1 to determine for the capacitor of capacitance 3 microfarad the charge on one plate of the capacitor. You know that charge is equal to charge of one plate. That's why Q is equal to CV, so C is 1.2 and V is 8, so you can find charge. This is total charge, 
uh, for these two but you know that total charge in series is equal to charge of 3 microfarad or equal to charge of 2 microfarad so charges in series are the same that's why 9.6 will be answer for charge of one plate of three microfarad capacitance the energy is stored in the capacitor so formula of energy is equal to one over two qv one over two uh, cv square or equal to q square divided by 2c you can use any of them to get your answer so charge for three microfarad uh, you, you got from first part 9.6 micro coulomb so micro means 10 to the power negative 6 so 9.6 times 10 to the power negative 6 divided by 2c 2 times c is 3 3 times 10 to the power negative 6 it is microfarad so if you simplify the answer uh, answer for energy of um, 3 microfarad energy stored in 3 microfarad is 1.5 times 10 to power negative 5 joule. Question 7. Negative feedback is often used in amplifiers. A state. What is meant by negative feedback? Okay, answer is here. A negative feedback amplifier or feedback amplifier is an electronic amplifier that subtracts a fraction of its output from its input so subtracts a fraction of its output from its input so that negative feedback opposes the original signal and this is a simple um, figure if you want to draw it no problem but there is no mark for figure. If you want, you can draw it to understand better. Two effects of negative feedback on the gain of an amplifier. Number one, you know that if some of the output voltage come to the input, so gain becomes smaller. So a smaller gain, this is one effect. And the second one, greater bandwidth. So negative feedback causes greater bandwidth part b an ideal operational amplifier is incorporated into the circuit shown calculate the gain of the amplifier so you know that gain when there is a feedback negative feedback gain is equal to one plus r for this part of feedback divided by 800 so 1 plus 6400 divided by 800 you can get get gain so gain is 9 so this is for example r1 this is or r4 um, loop negative feedback loop suppose this is r2 so 1 plus R1 divided by R2 will be gain for this figure. Determine the output potential difference for an input potential difference Vin. If Vin is 0 0.6 volt. So V out is equal to gain times Vin. So because gain, because gain is equal to V out divided by v in that's why v out is equal to gain times v in so gain is 9 you got from last part times input is 0 0.6 positive 0 0.6 so the answer is positive 5.4 so this is less than 9 volt less than 9 that's why v out will be positive 5.4 now if you put input negative 2.1 volt so v out will be negative 18.9 negative 18.9 is more than negative 9 for amplifier that's why amplifier is saturated and 
V out will be negative 9 volt. So V out is negative 9 volt. The gain of the amplifier is constant. A state one change that may be made to the circuit so that the amplifier circuit monitors temperatures with the gain decreasing as the temperature rises. So uh, it is about monitoring temperature with the gain decreasing as the temperature rises. So instead of a uh, fixed resistor of 6400 ohm, you should use one thermistor because in thermistor you know that uh, it works based on changing temperature so you can use thermistor uh, question 8 explain how a uniform magnetic field and a uniform electric field may be used as a velocity selector for charged particles First of all, velocity selector, this is extra information, velocity selector is used in mass spectrometers which it is desired to produce a beam of charged particles all moving with the same velocity. Okay. Then, uh, we have a power supply, positive and negative. We connect it to two uh, parallel plates, metal plates. So in uh, upper one, positive uh, charge can be shown. And in, um, sorry. And in negative plate you can see negative charges so from positive to negative plate we have electric field direction of electric field and magnetic field is into the page and it is vertical to perpendicular to electric field um, one particle come inside one particle come inside so uh, electric force and magnetic force become equal that's why uh, this particle can go out without any deviation this is called a velocity selector so now explanation the region the region between the plates the region between the plates is also occupied by a uniform magnetic field of flux density B which is at right angle to the electric field charged particles enter from the left they all have the same charge and mass but are traveling at different speeds electric force E times E will be the same on all particles as it doesn't depend on their speed so electric force depends it doesn't depend on their speed however magnetic force QVB or BEV will be greater <clears throat> on these particles which are traveling faster hence for particle traveling at the desired speed the electric and magnetic forces balance and they emerge undeflected from the slit S so you can see a slit S here If a negative ion has a speed greater than V over BD, the downward magnetic force on it will be greater than upward electric force. Thus, it will be deflected downwards and it will hit below a slit S. So for this question, you should explain a summary of this part. So summary of this uh, 10 12 lines if you explain summary of this uh, 10 12 line 
for three or four lines will be enough for velocity selector. Part B, particles having mass m and charge positive 1.6 times 10 to the power negative 19 coulomb pass through a velocity selector. They then enter a region of uniform magnetic uh, field of magnetic flux density 94 millitesla with a speed 3.4 times 10 to the power of 4 meter per second. The direction of the uniform magnetic field is into the page and normal to the direction of which particles are moving. The particles are moving in a vacuum in a circular arc of diameter 15 centimeter. Show that mass of one of the particles is 20 U. So first of all, what is U? U is unified atomic mass unit. And 1U is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the power negative 27 kilogram. Now, for this part, uh, because it is said that the particles are moving in a vacuum in a circular arc, that's why magnetic force should be equal to centripetal force. Magnetic force for a particle is QVB sine theta, which sine theta in this question is 90, so you should ignore it, equal to centripetal force, which is equal to MVS squared divided by R. If you simplify, you will get M equal QBR divided by V. If you substitute numbers, you can get M is equal to 3.32 times 10 to the power negative 26 kg. Now you want in U. That's why you should divide this mass by 1.66 times 10 to the power negative 27. Then you will get mass in U. So it will become 19.99 uh, U, which is equal to 20 nearly 20 u on figure next part on figure 8.1 a sketch the path in the uniform magnetic field of a particle of mass 22 u having the same charge and speed first of all it is said that same charge and speed and uniform magnetic field okay so magnetic field charge and speed are the same that's why that's why based on this formula based on this formula r is directly proportional to mass so larger mass means larger radius that's why you should draw larger radius so little by little you can see that uh, this curve will go away from the previous curve so you can show it uh, clearly so 22u is more than 20u that's why r for 22u is more than r20 question 9 a state what is meant by the magnetic flux linkage of a coil a uh, complete explanation of magnetic flux linkage uh, it is uh, from AQA revision 2017 so it is said that more coils in a wire means a larger EMF is induced magnetic flux linkage is a quantity commonly used for solenoids which are made of n turns of wire flux linkage is defined as the product of the magnetic flux and the number of turns of the coil. It is calculated using the equation magnetic flux linkage equal to phi times n, n is number of turns, which is equal to B A N because phi is equal to B times A. Next part.
A coil of wire has 160 turns and diameter 2.4 cm. The coil is situated in a uniform magnetic field of flux density 7.45 millitesla. Direction of magnetic field is along the axis of the coil. Magnetic flux density is reduced to zero in a time of 15, 0.15 second. Show that the average EMF inducing the coil is 3.6 millivolt. Okay. Uh, magnetic flux linkage is equal to NBA cosine alpha. It is said that magnetic flux density reduced to zero. Magnetic flux density means B. So final B becomes zero. So when B is zero, phi is zero as well. Phi is magnetic flux linkage and alpha is zero why because direction of line vertical to this ring and direction of magnetic field and uh, magnetic field they are parallel so these lines and magnetic field are parallel that's why alpha is zero cosine alpha is equal to one so we can ignore cosine alpha in this part now emf is equal to rate of change of magnetic flux linkage so emf is equal to negative phi 2 minus phi 1 divided by delta t phi 2 is 0 because b2 is 0 that's fine phi 1 divided by t what is phi nba cosine 0 so nba cosine 0 is 1 so nba divided by t so electromotive force is equal to nba divided by t uh, it is 160 turns and B is 7.5 millitesla and A is cross-section area A is cross-section area which is equal to pi r square pi r is half diameter so diameter is 2.4 so divide by 2 is 1.2 times 10 to power negative 2 s square this is a cross-section area of uh, <coughs> this figure for this coil so divide by 0 0.15 second so you will get 3.6 times 10 to power negative 3 which is equal to 3.6 milli Volt. Magnetic flux density B in the coil is now uh, varied with time t as shown in figure 9.2. Use data in B to show on figure 9.3 the variation with time of EMF induced in the coil. Between time of 0 and 0 0.1, B is constant. That's why electromotive force is 0. Between 0 0.25 and 0 0.35, also electromotive force is 0 because B is constant. Between 0 0.45 and 0 0.55, electromotive force is 0. So these yellow line on T axis shows zero electromotive force between 0 0.1 and 0 0.25 uh, we got electromotive is 3.6 millivolt so you can choose 3.6 and between 0 0.1 and 0 0.25 you can draw a line then When T 
is 0 0.35 to 0 0.425 electromotive force will be 2 times 3.6 which is equal to 7.2 millivolt why times by 2 because when time divided by 2 in this part in this formula then electromotive force will be times by 2 that's why electromotive force will be uh, 7.2 millivolt and you can draw 7.2 a uh, straight line and you can see that there are two electromotive force which are not zero and three of them are zero question 10 describe the photoelectric effect emission of electron when electromagnetic radiation incident on metal surface so emission of electron when electromagnetic radiation like light incident on metal surface next part uh, some information are given so first part it is said that a state what is meant by a photon so you can say a packet amount of energy of electromagnetic radiation packet amount of energy of electromagnetic radiation calculate the energy of a photon of the incident light you know that energy of a photon is hf h is Planck constant and f is frequency in a set of f you can write c a speed of light divided by wavelength so substitute numbers you can find energy of a photon which is 4.7 times 10 to the power negative 19 joule a state whether photoelectric emission will occur from each of the metals for sodium we can say yes because for sodium you can say that phi uh, work function is 3.8 times 10 to the power negative 19 so it is a less than energy of a photon that's why um, photoelectric emission happens and for zinc you can say no because phi of zn uh, work function of work function energy of zn is more than energy of a photon that's why photoelectric emission doesn't happen question 11 describe the basic principles of CT scanning computed tomography okay answer is below a CT scanner takes x-ray images of the same slice at many different angles this process is repeated then images of successive slices are combined together a computer pieces these images together to build a 3d image the 3d image can be rotated and viewed from different angles so this is principles of CT scanning by reference to your answer in A, suggest why CT scanning wasn't possible before fast computers with large memories were available. Because you know that combining images involves large number of calculations. That's why we need fast computers with large memories. The radiation dose for a CT scan is much larger than for an X-ray image of a leg bone. So why? Because CT scan consists of many images, or you can say CT scan consists of many single X-ray images. That's why radiation dose for CT scan is much larger than X-ray image. Question 12. A state what is meant by radioactive decay? So, a spontaneous emission of particles by unstable nucleus. So, you, if you mention a spontaneous emission, you get one mark, and by unstable nucleus, you get another mark. Next part. 
An unstable nucleoid P has decay constant lambda P and decays to form a nucleoid D. This nucleoid D is unstable and decays with decay constant lambda D to form a stable nucleoid S. The decay chain is illustrated in figure 12.1. Initially, a radioactive sample contains only nuclei P. The variation with time t of the number of nuclei of each of the three nuclides in the sample is shown in figure 12.2. Okay. On figure 12.2, use the symbols B, P, D, and S to identify the curve for each of the three nuclides. So you can see that P initially must have larger, uh, uh, I mean, uh, radioactivity. That's why number of uh, initial number of atoms must be maximum. That's why uh, this curve is P. And then D must have maximum. That's why this is D. And after that, S because initially S is zero, and after decaying nuclei D, S is created. That's why initially S is zero, and then uh, by increasing time, by passing time, S increasing. So this is S. Half-life of nuclei P is 60 minutes. Calculate the decay constant P, uh, lambda P, in second, in one over second of this nuclei. So we know that lambda is equal to ln2 divided by half-life. So ln of 2 is equal to 0 0.693, this is constant, divided by 60 minutes, 60 times 60, uh, because uh, answer must be in second, 1 over second. So lambda will be 1.93 times 10 to the power of negative 4, 1 over second. In the decay chain shown in figure 12.1, lambda p is approximately equal to 5 lambda d. The decay chain of the different nuclei is illustrated in figure 12.3. The decay constant lambda f of nuclei f is very much larger than decay constant lambda e. By reference to the half-life of nuclei f, explain why the number of nuclei of nuclei f in the sample is always a small. So, half-life of F is much shorter than half-life of E. So, half-life of F is much shorter than half-life of E. So, nuclei of F decay as soon as they are produced. That's why uh, number of nuclei of nuclei F in the sample is always a small. Because as soon as F decay, uh, sorry, uh, nuclei of F decay as soon as they are produced. So when they are produced, they decay. That's why uh, number of nuclei F in the sample is always a small. Thank you very much and goodbye.